For over 50 years, the Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College has hosted preeminent scientists, theologians, and ethicists to discuss questions at the intersection of science and society. From the newest results in physics, chemistry, and biology to the newest fields of multidisciplinary study, scientists at the Nobel Conference have examined the universe at its largest and smallest scales, explored the oceans, described new materials, and investigated human and animal behavior. Conference speakers have debated the mechanisms of aging as well as the science and economics of food. Often speakers have given us a glimpse of the next defining questions and how they might be answered. Throughout all of the conversations, ethicists and theologians have grounded the science in a human dimension. This year's conference focuses on addiction, a uniquely human condition. The 51st Nobel Conference, Addiction, Exploring the Science and Experience of an Equal Opportunity Condition, brings together experts in medicine, neuroscience, sociology, and philosophy to explore the science and experience of addiction. The conference explores a range of questions. What does it mean to be addicted? Is it a brain condition? A psychological disorder? A sociological problem? The answers to these questions raise a very important one. What treatment options are available? We hope you enjoy this year's presentation by Mark Lewis entitled, Reflections on the Science and Experience of Addiction. Mark Lewis is a professor of developmental psychology at Radboud University in the Netherlands. He has authored or co-authored more than 50 journal articles in neuroscience and developmental psychology. Dr. Lewis's critically acclaimed book, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, is the first to blend memoir and science in addiction studies. His more recent book, The Biology of Desire, Why Addiction is Not a Disease, has already stirred controversy among addicts, their families, and treatment providers. I, I want to you know, thank, th thank the people who invited me here. There's a number of you, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how the hierarchy works, but Scott, thank you in particular for getting me here. It's been uh, um, uh, it's just been great. And, and it's just beginning. I'm going to be here for another week, a week and a half, so uh, as a Rydell uh, assistant, whatever, a visiting professor or something like that. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a nice chance to, to, to get to know the, the college uh, deeply. And uh, thank you, of course, also to President Bergman for uh, overseeing and making this possible and, and uh, obviously for bringing all of our attention to this particular issue, which I think is so important. Um, I was, I was going to try to to see if I could use this talk to bring together some of the diverse opinions and approaches that we've heard in the last two days. I think I've kind of, well, I'll try a little bit, but you know, it's, I can't heal all the rifts and there are rifts, there are tensions, there are real tensions and I can't make them go away. Um, but I, and I think probably at times I will sound, um, you know, like, well, like Carl said before he started pounding the pulpit, you know, forgive me if I pound the pulpit and uh, if I'm, you know, zealous about what I, what was the word he used? Uh, uh, trenchant or something? Strident, strident. Yeah, I'll probably be strident at times. And, and you know, given that I argue against the uh, utility and validity of the disease model of addiction, this word disease, it's come up a lot in both, on many sides of many conversations in the last two days. So just to be a little bit more conciliatory, I, I, I don't think anyone who talks about addiction as a disease is a bad guy, and I'm, I'm learning more about it, and I think connecting more and being more flexible as, as I uh, connect with people on all sides of the debate, and it is a debate. So when I talk about the disease model, let's just say I'm talking about the um, traditional disease model, the, uh, and, and not about some of uh, people's ideas about medical approaches to addiction that are more humanistic, more uh, uh, embedded in psychological thinking and, and uh, uh, other trends that I think are really important. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so learning addiction, connecting the science with the experience. Uh, to start off with, you know, this has been a strange conference because in many ways you've heard from speakers all the way around the circle, uh, but you, I don't think you've heard anything coming from the middle of the circle. So some of you are probably wondering, you know, what, what, what are they talking, what is addiction anyway exactly? How do you, how do you think of this thing? Uh, and there are, in fact, uh, many 
models of addiction, and that's the problem. It's one of the problems. There's the disease model, of course, and you'll hear more about that. There's the choice model. Very often that's construed as the opposite. So addiction is either a disease or a choice, right? So this is a dichotomy, and I think it's a false dichotomy, but that's the way it's often considered. And a choice is supposed to, and, and, you know, and Owen Flanagan talked, talked today about uh, this issue in some depth. Uh, if it's a choice, it's construed as a rational choice, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. Um, the social construction of addiction, we, we, uh, we heard about that from, what's her name? Um, uh, well, anyway, um, the idea that there's a whole lot about the definition of addiction that comes from the social surround, and rather than being intrinsic to the phenomenon itself. You, I'm, I'm trying to find your name. Dr. Murphy, sorry, Sheila. Uh, okay, um, and so, yeah, so that there is a, it's a normative issue rather than some intrinsic property of the individual or the n nervous system or anything else. Uh, then there's the model that, uh, of um, self-medication. You know, I wish I could change the way this, is there another? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, oh, it, really, huh? Now what do I do? I usually use this, this on my screen. Is there no way to show that? I had this problem in lecture once in a great while. But you have a different configuration than I do. Dobo. Help. <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay. He wants presenter mode. I'd prefer to just look at, on my screen, what you're looking at on your screen. One moment, please. All right. Let me see. This is the magician act. Oh. Um, well, while the magician is performing his magic, I will just continue. Um, that, so the, the self-medication model is the idea that addiction is a response to early trauma. Uh, issues of often neglect or abuse in, in childhood or adolescence or any other, um, any other uh, tr trigger of anxious and depressive feelings so that a person actually feels crummy and as a result tries drugs or other addictive activities that make them feel better. So that's the self-medication model and it has to do with, tra with one's traumatic early history. And there's a lot to support that. Are we okay? No, I'm stuck with that. That's the way we had it originally. But that's okay, I'll get used to it. Or mirrored? I just want to see what's on the screen. I don't. Oh, got it. Uh, yeah. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> that. Does that work? <laughs> it's okay. I, I, honestly, it's really okay to go back to the uh, original. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. All right then. Um, maybe my glasses will help now. Cause see, it's about a quarter the size. Yeah, that's better. No, no, no. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> no more fussing. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and last but not least, the learning model, which is the model that I espouse and, and many other people do too. And in fact, I think most of us do to some extent, even the people who talk about their approach as being more connected with medicine, the medical camp and the disease model, recognize that disease is in some respect learned. But I think that's a very central issue. Yeah, Mike, for example. Um, so I think that's a very, very central issue, and that's what I'm going to highlight. Um, okay, so when, when you define addiction as a brain disease, the, the, the current prevalent definition comes from NIDA, as we've heard, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it is as follows. Addiction is defined as a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. Um, you know, and I could have started off this talk by saying, is this just a, a matter of definition? Why do we care what we call it? But as someone mentioned today very persuasively, I think, maybe it was you, 
<laughs> um, whatever your name is. <laughs> um, that, um, yeah, it was you. The, the definition really matters. It's not, just a, it's not just whether you call it, you know, a tomato or a tomato. It's not that. Because, um, because there's a huge, huge, uh, um, uh, uh, what should I call it, um, camp uh, um, that uh, power, powerfully, economically, scientifically, clinically, uh, that's, that, that defines addiction as a disease and that controls an awful lot of drug policy and drug research, not only here, but throughout the world. Uh, and, and that hegemony is a word, I mean, you know, that dominant position is so powerful that it has permeated the field and really kind of uh, uh, structured and created a particular orientation to addiction that in the end doesn't work very well. And we know that because of the crazy relapse rates and the revolving door phenomenon, that it doesn't work very well. And a problem that, is, that uh, adjoins that problem is that when things like that don't work very well, people who are part of the dominant position say, we need more money and more research to make it work better. Whereas another approach would be to say, well, if it's not working well, maybe it's wrong. <laughs> right? So anyway, that's why I think it's more than just a matter of definition. I think there are very important conceptual issues here to think about. And by the way, can I trouble somebody for a glass of water, please? That will help. OK, so NIDA's definition starts off here. Chronic, relapsing brain disease emphasize chronic. That's part of the definition, chronic. Brain imaging studies from drug-addicted individuals show physical changes in areas of the brain that are critical for judgment, decision-making, learning, memory, and behavior control. Uh, underline um, uh, uh, physical changes in the brain. That's an important part of the definition. Okay. And lastly, this is by a previous head of NIH. In vulnerable individuals, the disease of addiction is produced by chronic administration of the drugs themselves. So that's the third part. Addiction is caused by the drugs. And we, of course, heard about that from Carl Hart today, that it's not caused by the drugs at all. It's caused by something else, or perhaps has multiple causes. But it's not that simple. Um, some advantages of the disease model uh, are that it does provide a coherent definition, and we obviously need coherence in this field, so that really helps us think about something, is to you know, give it a label and put it in a category. Um, it shifts addiction from a moral issue to a medical issue, which reduces stigma, minimizes feelings of shame and guilt, and encourages treatment by current providers. Those are all possible advantages. Uh, Although I think there are other ways to reduce stigma than to tell someone that they have a chronic disease that causes them to do nasty things for the rest of their lives. That's, that doesn't make you feel good, really, you know. Um, so, yeah. But that's one of the stigmatization issue. Well, I think it's come and gone. I think, yes, it's better to think of addiction as a disease than to think of it as a failing of the soul or something like that. You know, or a moral abomination. But I hope we've gotten past that, moved on, and I think that we can now have other reasons not to despise uh, addicts. Um, okay, and lastly, it has powered the development of new and often effective pharmaceutical treatments, like uh, my new email-based friend Percy Menzies has taught me the, uh, special, the drugs naloxone and naltrexone, incredibly useful for, uh, for opiate addicts uh, without having to provide them with a substitute, opiate. Okay, so these are important, um, important innovations. Okay, um, so what is this disease model? What is the model? What's the dominant model? Here it is, in a nutshell. We've got the uh, dorsolateral, especially, prefrontal cortex. You all know about the prefrontal cortex. Dorsolateral is right here. That's kind of the... Uh, the, uh, most, uh, um, the part that's in charge of insight and decision-making and judgment and stuff like that. Right? Important, high-level cognitive operations. Um, so I call it the bridge of the ship, okay? That's where you do your controlling, your steering from. And the striatum, which is this big hunk of stuff that's got all many different components to it, 
Uh, at the southern pole of the striatum, we have the nucleus accumbens, or ventral striatum. You're not going to get a whole lot of, uh, of, of jargon, but here's a little bit. And that is the motivational engine of the brain. So the striatum is in charge of pursuing goals, going after goals. And in order to go after goals, we need to be motivated. We need to feel that we want something. And that feeling, whether you want to call it desire or attraction, or in the case of addiction, we often call it craving. That feeling, that push, is essential. And that's what the striatum does. And that's why the striatum is considered such a villain when it comes to addiction, is because it is the source of that feeling of forward thrust, I want it, I need it, I have to have it. And lastly, the dopamine pump. The, um, the midbrain, or the specifically ventral tegmental area, VTA, I have to call it that because some of the slides show that, uh, but it's really essentially the dopamine pump. It's a part of the brain deep down inside that manufactures dopamine. And many of you have, I'm sure, read about dopamine when you read about the brain basis of, of addiction. They used to call it the pleasure chemical. They now know that it's not about pleasure so much as it's about attraction. Dopamine has actually many purposes, but its main purpose is to narrow the range of attention and focus, so you focus on one particular thing, and then the push or drive to go and get it, do it, uh, take it, whatever. Okay. So it's a very all-purpose, very important neurotransmitter, uh, but it's especially the fuel for the striatum and for areas of the prefrontal cortex. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's it. The neural, neurobiology lesson is over. You can relax. Um, and uh, an important part of the model is that there is a connection between the striatum and the prefrontal cortex, especially this part here, which is really important because the bridge of the ship has to control what's going on in the engine room. There has to be some kind of communication between these systems. And as the striatum evolved to get us to go after goals, the prefrontal cortex and other cortical regions up here also evolved to help us control our impulses and monitor them and modulate them and worry about you know, the consequences and all that other stuff. So these areas are communicating in normal brain activation all the time, in all brain activation. They're communicating a lot, except that in addiction, the communication breaks down. So that's a key feature of the model, is a communication breaks down between these regions, so you lose some of that capacity for control, okay? And that creates a kind of a wall or, yeah, this border between the prefrontal regions and the uh, motivational regions of the brain. Okay, so functional change leads to structural change, right? That's true of the brain and it's true of the liver and it's true of most biological matter that functional change leads to structural change. What that means with respect to the, the brain is that um, if you get less activation in the prefrontal cortex, then over time you're going to lose gray matter, you're going to lose synapses, you're going to lose yeah, connections. Um, and that's what this graph shows. This, is, uh, uh, this shows gray matter volume. Okay, Is this all showing up on the screen? I can't see it. When I point to it, you're seeing it? Good. Okay, gray matter volume in this case really just means synapses. Think of it as just density of synapses, okay? Synapses means connections. Um, with years of use of alcohol, cocaine, and heroin, you get a reduction in synapses in a few prefrontal, important prefrontal areas. It goes down, 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 below the baseline for the normal population. Okay, so that's a loss of synapses with years of use of addictive substances. Um, use it or lose it, which looks suspiciously like a brain disease, right? Okay. But there's another way to look at this stuff. And uh, so what I try to do, and I say there's a lot of people who support a learning model of addiction, but not too many of them are neuroscientists. And that's what I do, is I do neuroscience research. So not too many people who support a learning model actually uh, talk about brain processes. In fact, usually, as soon as you mention brain, um, a lot of people think that, oh, you're a reductionist and you think of addiction as a disease and it's all in the brain and what about the social surround and what about society and what about you know, societal, societal normative issues and all that. 
Well, no, it's not a dichotomy, not for me. For me, the brain exists in a body which exists in a social group, which exists in a society. So as, as we've discussed in different ways, there may be many levels to this issue of addiction, and I want to focus on the brain level, but not exclusively. I just want to focus on it, and I want to show that that's not, doesn't have to lead us to the conclusion that this is a pathology or a disease. It's serious, but it's not a disease. Okay, so when I reinterpret the neural data, the first, the first step is um, to recognize that brains change with learning and development. Well, we heard this from Dr. Kandel yesterday in a lot of detail, and it was a f totally convincing, and we've known this for many, many decades now, that the brain is designed to change, and that learning involves change, and memory involves change, and everything the brain does involves brain change. And Dr. Kandel gave us the example of the hippocampus of London cab drivers are bigger than yours and mine because they had to remember all those streets. So learning always involves brain change, and without brain change, you're in big trouble. You want the brain to change. Well, the people who look at addiction from a neuroscience perspective are not dummies. They know this, right? They must know this. Um, so uh, so I, would, I would qualify this by saying brains change with learning. So brain change doesn't mean brain disease unless the brain change seen in addiction is very different from that seen in dot, 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 normal development, first of all. Okay, normal development. So what does brain change look like in normal development? Just to remember, just you know, a little rule of thumb. Learning equals synaptic restructuring. So we all know that. We all agree about that. So here's a little movie that shows brain change, developmental brain change in normal individuals from the age of four to the age of 20. It's an eight-second video, so it's quite condensed. Um, and you have to watch very carefully, but I'll play it a couple of times. Um, and uh, they take uh, MRI... Uh, imaging of kids' brains at, at many, many, many different ages, between 4 and 20, and they average the images together, and then they can show you an average trajectory of brain change with development. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Age 4, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, we're starting at age 4, and here we go. So you see, what, what happens with development is that the brain turns blue. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no, not really. Um, actually, if you look at the scale on the right, you can see that the reddish colors, um, let's go back to the beginning, the reddish and yellowish colors uh, stand for thicker gray matter. This is gray matter amount on this scale, and gray matter amount is, goes up from, this, this is an ordinal scale, it goes up to higher, thicker gray matter um, as you move into the yellow and red range, but as you move into the blue and purple range, you get thinner cortex. This is all cortex, okay? So let's watch again and recognize that as the color shifts from yellow and red to blue, the cortex is getting thinner. Okay, so the message is, there's a very specific built-in developmental schedule for the thinning of the cortex, for the loss of synapses across all of the cortex. You can see where I'm going here. <clears throat> um, it's really interesting. I could look at this movie all day. It, <laughs> it's very cool, because look at, like, here's a, a four-year, here's a four-year-old, um, and, okay, here's like an nine-year-old, I might talk about my kids a bit there, I've got a couple of nine-year-old twins at home, my second batch, but, um, but I'm actually much younger than I look. Uh, um, and with young kids, you see, it's already blue here in the sensory motor strip because young kids know how to kick a ball, right? They know how they're, they're in control of their bodies and their senses, so that's already matured and turned blue. But this part here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has a long way to go. It is not yet mature. And same with some other regions too, but especially look here at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It is the slowest to develop. It's the slowest to get blue. It's the slowest to get thin. It's the slowest to, to prune. And in fact, the prefrontal cortex doesn't finish developing until well into your 20s. Okay? And as it develops, your thinking becomes more efficient. 
Okay, now this is not a little change. As many as 30,000 synapses may be lost per second over the entire cortex during the pubertal adolescent period. So even for the brain, that's a big number. 30,000 synapses lost per second. And this is normal development. Okay, what's going on? Development, brain development, is comprised of two mechanisms, synaptic growth and synaptic pruning. The proliferation of synapses on the one hand and the pruning or cutting back of synapses on the other hand. And I use this uh, example of ivy growing on the garden wall. So uh, synaptic growth, think of it in terms of fle more flexibility, novelty, increasing range of knowledge and skills is very important, obviously, for development. And here's the proliferation into a more disorganized pattern. And that's pretty typical in childhood, which is why kids are pretty disorganized in a way. But then with ongoing development, you get synaptic pruning, consolidation, efficiency, and habit formation. And this characterizes the period of later childhood and adolescence when there's a lot of pruning going on and the brain becomes a lean, mean machine. Okay, it becomes much more efficient and focused. It's like getting rid of a bunch of little roads and replacing them with a few main streets that, through which traffic moves much more efficiently, and that's how you get from A to B to C, and that's why teenagers at least start to think logically, um, but th that doesn't really uh, uh, fle get fleshed out until the 20s, at least. Uh, but that's synaptic pruning. That's uh, thanks to th synaptic pruning. Okay, so... So that's normal brain development. Uh, one other comparison I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make is that brain change doesn't mean brain disease unless the brain change seen in addiction is different from that seen in... <laughs> it seems to be dizzy. Uh, other intense emotional experiences such as falling in love. There's other examples. I mean, maybe like becoming a jihadist is one, or I don't know, an intense religious conversion, or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of intense emotional experiences having children. I mean, we, whether the brain doesn't care whether it's good or bad in terms of its moral value, but if it's an intense, intense emotional experience, then it gets repeated more and more and more often, which means that more learning is going to take place. You're going to see more intense and often more rapid change in synaptic structure, okay? So what happens when you fall in love? Well... I'm going to just read, you don't have to read this, I'm going to read it to you. I, I couldn't find good graphics for this, they're just a mess, it's really hard to comb the journals and get graphics that show you anything other than blobs of color um, in places that I might point to and say that's a this and this is a that, who cares, right? So I'm just going to read it to you. Um, like with drugs of abuse, mesolimbic dopamine is a major contributor to the formation of pair bonds in prairie voles and particularly in the nucleus accumbens region. Remember, the nucleus accumbens is the southern pole of the striatum, and that's the part that's in charge of impulsivity, impulsive desire, impulsive uh, uh, attraction to, to things, drugs, roulette, poker, drugs, did I say drugs? Uh, alcohol, and all the rest of it. Um, and we study prairie voles because they are one of the few mammals that are monogamous, that we think to be monogamous, which is supposed to be a model of, uh, of uh, people. <laughs> right. So, um, mating has been shown to cause dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens in rodents. In prairie voles, pair bonding between mating partners is prevented if dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens are blocked, etc., etc., etc. You need dopamine, you need to get it into your southern striatum in order to mate if you're a prairie vole. Well, what about if you're a human? Okay, so here's, uh, here's a couple of other gems that I found. Um, this is from uh, Fisher and colleagues. She's done a lot of research in, in the neurobiology of uh, sex, attraction, and uh, interpersonal uh, romantic relationships. To determine the neural mechanisms associated with romantic love, we use functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, uh, and studied 17 people who were intensely in love. So we're talking about the first you know, six months to a year, the, the part, the, you know, the really, really fun part. <laughs> before you get to know each other really well. <laughs> um, uh, 
people who are intensely in love, activation specific to the beloved, so when you're with the beloved or seeing images of the beloved on a screen, um, occurred in the right ventral tegmental area, that's the VTA, the part in the midbrain that sends the, oops, that sends the dopamine up, and the right caudate nucleus, sorry, that's part of the striatum too, that's the caudate is the north pole of the striatum, um, dopamine-rich areas associated with mammalian reward and motivation. I know it's a mouthful, but it is really saying that love lights up the same brain parts as does addiction. Now, and there's, there's more, lots of interesting stuff. Here's another one. Uh, this is about how people feel when they are rejected in romantic relationships. That's why I titled the slide, Love and Hate. Uh, I thought it would be a great novel someday. Um, participants alternately viewed a photograph of their rejecting beloved and a photograph of a familiar individual Activation specific to the image of the beloved occurred in areas associated with gains and losses, craving, craving and emotion regulation, and included the ventral tegmental area, there it is again, the dopamine pump, the VTA, um, the ventral striatum, that's the southern pole of the striatum, again, medial and, okay, blah, 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 other stuff too. Uh, and activate, and, and they conclude by saying activation of areas involved in cocaine addiction may help explain the obsessive behaviors associated with rejection and love. I think that's really interesting. Um, I also found something on, um, uh, on stalking, what the brain dynamics of stalking. I, I, I'm not going to read it to you because it was a bit complicated. But it's, I think stalking is a great metaphor, analogy, or homology with, uh, with addiction. Stalking. You continue going after the thing you love even though it's not working anymore. You know, and it's leading you to great grief and causing you to engage in criminal behavior because you can't let go. It's a perfect analogy for addiction. And guess what? It looks the same on a brain scan. Okay, so... It looks like the brain changes seen in addiction are not different from those seen in normal development and normal learning, nor are they different from those seen in intense emotional experiences like falling in love or falling in hate. Okay? They look like other intense emotional experiences and, and, and development in general. So what happens when we view addiction and recovery in terms of learning and development? Well, again, with development, just remember that we've got synaptic uh, proliferation, synaptogenesis, and synaptic pruning, both. Okay, just keep that in mind. And that synaptic pruning, the function of that is the consolidation of the circuitry, more efficient behavior, and habit formation. Because guess what? Habits are very efficient. If you had to think about it while you're driving a car, or, you know, uh, or writing, or trying to put words together in a sentence like I'm trying to do now, uh, you wouldn't be able to think about anything because you'd be too preoccupied with thinking about the thing that you're trying to do, which I'm now thinking about, and that's why I'm breaking down. Um, uh, so we have a lot of automatic behaviors that rely on, that are habits, and the brain and the system is designed for habits. Almost everything we do is habitual, except for the really fun stuff. Well, even that could be habitual, but not for long. I mean, not for long. Is it fun? It remains habitual. That's the problem with addiction. Okay. Um, and remember this picture, which shows the reduction in synaptic density with years of use of alcohol, cocaine, and heroin. Okay, so that's the, that's the data. Um, now, since pruning makes the brain more efficient, you could say that the addict's brain learns to efficiently pursue immediate rewards without much reflection and without the need for prefrontal supervision. So, addiction is a highly efficient mode of acquiring what you want. Again, prefrontal pruning becomes a habit, becomes automatic, it's more efficient. Addicts are very efficient. They get up in the morning, they don't have to worry about what to do that day. What they're going to do is go out and get some. Okay? This is very efficient. And they don't have to think about what's valuable because what's valuable is the thing they do. The heroin or methamphetamine or alcohol or sex or porn or gambling, whatever it is, behavioral or uh, substance related. So 
Okay, highly efficient mode of acquiring what you want. Unfortunately, you lose some of the synapses that help you control impulses, and it's bad for you. Again, I'm not saying even for a moment that addiction isn't bad for you. The fact that I see it in terms of learning doesn't mean that I don't see it as a very serious, uh, life-threatening often issue. And uh, although I agreed with a lot of what Carl Hart said today, I mean, really liked his talk and I thought it was brave, um, but I disagree with him about uh, the power of strongly addictive substances and activities. I think they can be classified as strongly addictive um, and they are bad for you. And I wouldn't like to see them being sold at the corner store. Although I do support decriminalization, uh, I don't necessarily support legalization of some of these uh, uh, more serious drugs, things like methamphetamine and heroin. I don't want them to be available uh, down the street when my kids uh, uh, you know, reach whatever the legal age for heroin is. <laughs> uh, and that would be a problem, you see. OK. so. So there's the reinterpretation. Is that the end of the story? Well, no, it's the beginning of the story, actually. So again, let's go to this, this graph of loss of synapses. And what these authors discovered was that um, the change in synaptic density in the prefrontal cortex that goes with years, the loss of synapses with years of use of these drugs reverses when people abstain. Okay, so with months, with weeks and months of abstinence, the density of synapses in these specific regions, now these are areas either in or related to close neighbors of the prefrontal cortex, especially the dorsolateral part of the prefrontal cortex, where it's, you're doing your decision making, judgment, and perspective taking. And look what happens. By 40 to 60 weeks of abstinence, synaptic density has, on average, gone back to the population baseline in these regions and continued, continued. So you're growing synapses. Are you growing back the same, same synapses? Probably not, because development is never reversible. You never go back exactly. There's never a clean slate. But you are growing new synapses in similar areas, which are probably doing a lot of the job that needed to be done. In other words, controlling your behavior, modifying your impulses, regulating and modulating your goal pursuit. All of those important things, you're growing synapses to help you do that when you abstain, because the brain is plastic. So the whole idea of a chronic brain disease is, I mean, it's almost just completely wrong. Not maybe completely, because maybe there are some things, well, obviously things like Alzheimer's, that's a different category, because we see you know, not irreversible changes. But when it comes to psychological and psychiatric issues, it is the idea of chronic st stops making sense. Uh, this neuroplasticity has been a big issue in uh, the last, I don't know. Well, Norman Doidge, I hope you've read Norman Doidge, The Brain That Changes Itself, fantastic book. And he has followed pioneers who have used the uh, principles of neuroplasticity to help uh, people with strokes recover, people with, with traumatic brain injuries recover a lot of function, even people with um, Parkinson's disease learn how to walk and use their muscles. Again, neuroplasticity can be guided. Neuroplasticity is the basic feature of the brain. The brain is plastic, it's always changing. Um, but you can also use that feature to guide direction, the direction of learning. And that's why uh, it can be a powerful tool when you think about how to change nasty patterns of behavior, whether they come from injury or disease or from learning. OK, so um, in the neuroplastic brain, this is what you see. You see a change. Uh, you see first pruning and then uh, synaptic uh, a development, which corresponds with one thing and one thing only, and that is behavior, the way, what you do. When you stop using drugs or booze, this is what happens. So we have to get to this change. We're not going to go in there and do neurosurgery on addicts, probably, right? So even though we're thinking of this in brain terms, we want to go in there through behavioral and social tools, because those are the tools we have available. And we can use those tools to change behavior, then we are changing the brain. And this is, this is the principle behind any psychotherapy, really. OK, so there's a couple of things that make addictive learning even more uh, intense and maybe more uh, uh, um, uh, rapid 
uh, and deeper and more consolidated than other forms of learning. So there's something about addictive learning that is particularly powerful and entrenched. And I'm gonna just give you a couple of phenomena that, that I think help make it that way. Uh, the first is something that uh, they call delayed discounting, and I call it now appeal. And this is what you know from the marshmallow test. Do you remember the marshmallow test? Okay, so these three-year-olds are sitting there and the experimenter says, you can have one marshmallow now and here it is. Or if you wait till I get back in the room, you can have two marshmallows and I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. And three and four-year-olds invariably go for the one marshmallow now. And I've been doing this with my, with my kids, my twins also. Whenever we go into a restaurant, there's that bowl of mints there. And I, you know, for years I've been saying, uh, do you want one mint now or do you want three mints after dinner? And for years they've been saying, now. <laughs> right? Because they've been young kids. And young kids don't have a lot of prefrontal cortex at their disposal, especially these upper reaches in charge of behavior modulation. However, in the last couple of years, from about the age of eight, nine, they've been more thoughtful about the matter. They now hesitate and say, well, maybe I'll wait and have three mints later. Um, because they're getting smarter, because their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is pruning. They're getting to be better thinkers. So in addiction, this is a real problem because uh, the marshmallows are, um, marshmallows are extremely attractive. One thing common to all addictive substances and experiences is, is that they are very attractive, even more attractive than marshmallows. And so, the, uh, and, so, and, and so when you hear people talking about addictive things, you know, it's really, it's this, ish, this issue of delayed discounting is built in, of now appeal. You never hear people saying, you know, let's go do some cocaine next week. <laughs> they say, let's do some cocaine tonight, or better yet, this afternoon. And, and this is uh, the idea that you are, you are compelled or impelled by what is immediate, what is in the immediate future, rather than by what might happen next week. And that's why it's called delay discounting. You're discounting the value of delayed rewards in favor of the value of immediate rewards. And it's a serious problem with addicts. In fact, in my book I talk about how addicts end up because they keep going after this immediate reward again and again and again. And it's always today, what, you know, where am I going to get it today? Today, now, tonight. And they keep thinking that way. Um, they lose the capacity to think in terms of the, of the future. They actually lose the capacity. And there's been research that shows that addicts, heroin addicts, for example, when you ask them to think about their future, they'll tell you about what might happen in a couple of years. Whereas when you ask non-addicts to think about their future, they'll tell you what's going to happen in 10 or 20 years. Addicts have a really hard time projecting into the future. They're kind of stuck in an eternal, circular, redundant now, present tense. And that's, I think that's just a fundamental problem. So um, the grip of the immediate goal outweighs the imagined future. And that, that's it in a nutshell. There's the immediate goal, there's the imagined future, and this one wins out. And I'm going to talk about this when I talk about recovery, because I think an important tool in recovery is to help addicts uh, regain a sense of what it's like to have a future and to imagine that future, to think about it, to be able to think about it, conceptualize it, and move toward it. Okay, and guess what? Uh, delayed discounting, or now appeal, is positively correlated with ventral striatum activity, same region. Uh, there's the graph. Uh, it just showing, shows more activity in that motivational core when there is increased now appeal. And that's what's happening in the striatum. In, I like this particular image. This is what's happening in the prefrontal cortex. Instead of more activity, you're seeing less activity. Again, there's that imbalance between the striatum, the motivational core, and the prefrontal cortex, the bridge of the ship. This is a TMS device, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it discombobulates the brain tissue right under that region. So this fellow, it's temporary, don't worry. Uh, at least that's what they tell the subjects. Uh, this fellow uh, is discombobulating his left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and as a result, he is showing a different, uh, a different this is called a discounting curve, but what it means is he's making a, high, uh, a lower proportion of patient choices. So he's going for the now instead of the later. 
And uh, that's because his prefrontal cortex has been temporarily uh, gone out for a lunch break, okay, while he's doing this task. So there's the imbalance recreated in the lab that we see in the life, in the natural circumstances, in the developing life of, the, of, the, uh, of, of addicts. Um, and by the way, this wasn't clarified in your introductory comments, Patricia, but I, I was there. I was one, an addict. Uh, in my second half of my 20s. Uh, I was pretty seriously addicted to opiates, uh, and I, I went to a lot of trouble to get them, mainly stealing and forging prescriptions. Uh, and I know exactly what this feels like. This feels like I really can't think about tomorrow. I really don't care. I know this is really dangerous, risky, and I know that when I get home uh, and, you know, either I'm gonna have to basically get there after my wife goes to sleep, or tell her what I've been doing, or somehow make some kind of lie up about it, or else we're gonna have another big, terrible fight. But that's later, and I don't care about later. What I care about is right now. Okay, so this is the incredibly pervasive power of the immediate present, and it means you're basically not having the advantage, the scaffolding provided by this part of your brain. Okay, here's another phenomenon that works against, uh, that works in favor of addiction against recovery, ego fatigue. Um, and uh, the, the core experiment was uh, that you sit down, um, you, they, they invited, this was uh, right in the early 90s, this, this, this has been studied in hundreds of, of experiments, but they, they brought people into the lab and they told them to be hungry, you can't have eaten for 12 hours or something and they sit them down in front of a bowl of radishes and a bowl of chocolate chip cookies. It's the same for everybody. Um, only one group is told they can eat as many radishes as they want, uh, but no chocolate chip cookies, and the other group is told the opposite. They can eat as many cookies as they want, but no radishes. This is a very clever, psychological, you know, perfectly balanced experiment, because nobody likes radishes. In fact, they exclude radish likers at the, at, <laughs> when they, at the recruiting stage. Um, so what happens? The people who've been sitting in front of the chocolate chip cookies are, uh, they've had to resist their, their hungry impulses, their wish to, to grab this thing, and, and um, it's kind of like, uh, like holding your arm out to the side. You can do it okay for a few minutes, but try doing it for an hour. It's pretty hard. And so you have to keep up this effort, and the brain isn't good at that. It's not good at keeping up cognitive effort to inhibit impulses. So the way they know that is after the task, they give them, after the, um, the, the condition, they give each group uh, a co cognitive task to do, and the group that had to restrain their cookie-eating impulses did more poorly on the cognitive tasks. They, had, they didn't have the same resources available for controlled cognitive activity to successfully complete these puzzles, okay? And there are all kinds of other things that once, we, we know a lot about ego fatigue, you get it all the time. And this is, you know, how you feel after you've spent an uncomfortable hour or two with your, I don't know, in-laws or whoever you, uh, may have to be extra polite in front of. If you have to be extra polite, then you know, that requires a lot of cognitive effort, and then you're kind of afterwards, you're probably gonna snap at your wife or husband on the way back, right? Because you've lost some of the capacity to inhibit. Okay, so that's a real problem for addicts, because First of all, um, there are cues, it's not like chocolate, well, it is sort of like chocolate chip cookies if you're in the cookie aisle of the supermarket, but otherwise, um, you are getting uh, cues about the thing that you're attracted to all of the time. Uh, this is where I come from, at least now, I'm a Canadian, but I'm in the Netherlands, and there's beer signs all over the place, and guess what the most serious addiction problem is in the Netherlands? Alcohol. People think, think it's marijuana, but it's not at all, it's alcohol. Okay, so there's the cues all over the place, reminding you of this delicious, nice beer that you could have if only you couldn't drink. Um, if only you could drink, I should say. If only you knew that, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, and, uh, okay, so there's the cues everywhere. And so the solution, what's the solution? Well, I don't know if you remember this lady, Nancy Reagan. Do you remember her from the 80s? Okay, the solution, in her opinion, and the opinion of the administration in the 80s, was just say no. 
Right? That was the main slogan of the war on drugs, just say no. But that doesn't work. That doesn't work against ego fatigue. And not only does it not work, but it makes it worse. So uh, here's a study showing the value of just saying no. These participants watched a terribly sad movie clip uh, about uh, a boy whose father got killed and he was all alone, and it's very, very sad. And half the group was told to suppress their emotions to, and to not express them on their face and to not feel them, to suppress their emotions, to just say no. And the other group was told, Okay, group one told, suppress emotions and expressions. Group two told, think about the film objectively and analytically. Okay, so that is not suppression. That is called reappraisal. And reappraisal is very different from suppression. Reappraisal means reframing the problem. And think about that if you're an addict. Just saying no is like, you know, I won't do it, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to do it, no, no, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think, of, okay, I'm thinking, I'm not going to think about it anymore, I'm not going to look at the phone number I'm looking up right now, uh, and, you know, they have to keep this attempt to suppress, keep it going, minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, and it makes things worse, it actually makes things worse, and here's evidence from neuroscience that it makes things worse. This particular EEG blip, which is called the ERN, error-related negativity, is produced by your prefrontal cortex when you are controlling your behavior. Okay, when you're controlling, when you're, when you're able to distinguish conflicting choices. Uh, and in the uh, reappraisal groups, the people who had to reappraise the film, you get a nice healthy ERN, a nice big blip right there. And uh, in this case, size matters. Because for the suppression group, uh, you get a little, little ERN right there, which means that the prefrontal cortex isn't putting out the electrical charge necessary to make the distinctions between good choices and bad choices. Okay? And here you see that the suppression group is down here. The reappraisal group looks exactly the same as the control group. So reappraisal works. It helps you to uh, overcome ego fatigue to move on, to not have to keep holding your hand out to the side. But just saying no doesn't work. It makes it worse. Okay, so now, to summarize, both um, now appeal and ego fatigue both produce this strange issue. More activation of the motivational core and less activation of the bridge of the ship. I haven't gone into details, but you get this with ego fatigue and now appeal, and you get it long term, you get it short term with taking drugs and long term with drug addiction. With drug addiction, you see this imbalance between the motivational center and the uh, bridge of the ship. And also in these short term, perfectly normal psychological responses to choices, you also see more activation of the motivational engine and less activation of the bridge of the ship. So I, it's hard to show this on a slide, um, but it's like you're rubbing out the connection between these regions. You're dissociating these regions. That's the best I could do on PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, and uh, so that's, that is a big problem. But you see, it's a problem that you come by honestly through learning and through acquiring habitual behavior that becomes automatized as habitual behaviors do through repeated activities of the same sort, the same sort. So you're learning the same reward pursuit, pursuing the same reward time after time after time after time, learning this one automatic activity that you, it's very difficult to suppress, that's always right around the corner, um, and that uh, causes brain changes because all learning experiences cause brain changes, but in this case, the brain changes uh, involve some loss of control. Okay, and when that happens, uh, addicts are in trouble. So, I'm gonna spend the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or so saying that I think the disease model of addiction isn't just wrong, I think it's also harmful. And again, let's call this the traditional old-fashioned disease model. Okay, and harmful because, and I think all of the speakers would, the, uh, of the last two days would agree with me on this, harmful because the disease model calls for medical treatment uh, as the first step, medical treatment. But medicalization makes addicts into patients. 
And patients don't feel they have the power to change their goals because they're not formulating those goals. Somebody else is. Now, medicine has a proper place as an adjunct to the kinds of help that addicts need, absolutely, and particularly for certain substances like opiates, like heroin. Uh, medication hasn't ever been helpful for uh, addiction to methamphetamine or cocaine, unless you just knock the person out or supply them with, again, alternatives, alternative addictions. And it's certainly not helpful against gambling and other behavioral addictions unless, again, I mean, you can give them anti-dopamine drugs, which basically are antipsychotics, which make you completely blunt and, and dampen all of your emotional experience, which is not very much fun. Uh, so again, medicalization, useful as an adjunct for particular addictions, but not the, main, not the main act. I think the main act is different because addicts don't need to be patients. So how do we help addicts feel like they're not patients? How do we help them feel empowered? And feeling empowered is the antidote to ego fatigue. And I think the way to do that is to help them strengthen their desire for other goals which they have lost sight of. They've lost track of. Um, it's like what happens when you give the wheel to your teenage kid. Your, your kid doesn't care about the car, doesn't care about maintaining the car, doesn't care about the tire pressure or scratches or making sure it's got enough gas or how you're driving or any of that other stuff until he's behind the wheel. And once he's behind the wheel, then he cares about all that stuff. So helping addicts to get a sense of empowerment, a sense of being the one in the driver's seat is critically important. And putting them in the role of a patient, and this is by the way what the drug courts do, because they're not only patients, they're not only under the control of their doctor, but they're also under the control of the courts who are controlling the doctor, who are controlling the patient. So the possibility for feeling that you are in charge of your life is greatly diminished. Okay, so that's the first thing. Strengthen the desire for other goals. Help addicts feel empowered. And how do we help addicts? Uh, how do we help them learn to get from now to later? How do we help them overcome now appeal? How do we help them develop a sense of the future? Which is a, yeah, a potent, uh, an antidote to now appeal. By helping them identify, and this is the part where psychotherapy comes in. Therapists, not only psychotherapy, friends, family, all the stuff that other people can do to help you. And even not only friends and family, but one's community, one's social surround. By helping them identify and hold on to future goals, not identifying those goals for them, by envisioning a future self, taking aim and advancing toward that future self. Kind of like that. Um, it, I, I don't. I think this is not a subtle point, but I want to. I want to sort of make. I want to bang you over the head with it. Um, if you have lost track of your future and you can't imagine a future other than a future of being an addict, because you've been an addict for ten years already. So if you imagine yourself next week, you imagine yourself again as an addict next week. That's the only sensible thing. To imagine other goals, you sometimes need help. And the kind of help you need can come from cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, other motivational techniques, uh, from mindfulness meditation practices, the John Kabat-Zinn method of uh, mindfulness training, which has been so successful with uh, depression and anxiety and chronic pain, is now being used to overcome addiction. Um, and support networks and support groups like the kind in AA, uh, which is, you know, I don't like the things about AA that we don't like, but, um, but the support network aspect I do like. And you can also get that at Smart Recovery. And there are other movements that really depend on the value of, of a social group that gives you a sort of scaffolding that helps you hold on to the sense of your life in time. You are here, but you're moving there. And you come from there. And this is a trajectory in time. This is a past, present, and future all linked together. A narrative, a story, a story that can be provided by other people. They can, if you've forgotten. If you've forgotten the story of your life, you might need some reminders. So I think that these are powerful techniques for getting at the heart of addiction. I think this is what's missing and what we can help to provide. Um, so in summary, treatment works by connecting empowerment, think of the striatum, to a sense of personal time. 
So activating desire for other goals, that's the striatum or nucleus accumbens, that's the motivational core. I want to quit. My goal is I want to quit. That's one of my goals, and I want to be with my kids. Okay, that's another powerful goal that people sometimes, that if you line them up with those goals, or, or, and this is often even more effective, wait until they're ready for those goals. Wait until they think, I've really had enough of this shit, and I really, really, really want to quit. And some approaches to addiction now, to recovery, uh, emphasize the importance of timing, of getting the addict right when they're ready to quit, because that's when they can switch. And that arc of electricity from the striatum to the goal can switch from the goal from heroin to being with your kids, for example. OK, so activating desire for other goals, nucleus accumbens, I want to quit. Imagining a future self reactivating the bridge of the ship, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is who I want to be, this is who I can be, this is who I will be, this is a sense of a future that you're holding on to and beginning to elaborate in your mind. Seeing your present self as a stage in your development from past to present to future. Okay, seeing your present self not just as an island in time, a floating island in time, which is what it feels like, but as a stage in your lifespan, which comes from, okay, and by the way, it's pretty important to get a sense of your past too, which is another place that psychotherapy can help a lot. How did I get to be this way? Why was I willing to give up so much so that I could take this drug or so that I could gamble? Why? Well, because, you know, when I was, in my case, because when I was 16, I was sent to a board, uh, 15, I was sent to a boarding school, which was absolutely miserable. And I was totally depressed for two years. I hated it there. It was a military school. And as you can probably tell, I'm not a military type guy. <laughs> so um, getting a sense of your past, really important because, and, and then that leads you to help understand where you are in the present. I am taking this stupid drug a lot, way too much. And then that can lead to a different future. I can be someone else. I can move to, away from this present to a different future. So you're moving from self-understanding. And here's, by the way, the crux of it. But it's maybe another book or another talk. You're moving from self-understanding to self-forgiveness to self-trust. Because when you start to understand yourself, this is why I'm doing this. This is how I got to be this way. Then you start to forgive yourself. And once you start to forgive yourself, then you feel some friendliness towards yourself, a sense of compassion for yourself. And once you start to feel that, there is somebody in here that you want to protect, that you want to provide a future for. So I think uh, that's pretty much where we want to go when we help addicts to overcome their addictions. And to base this kind of approach on science, we need to connect I think we need to connect the neurobiology of addiction with the experience of addiction. I think that's a very powerful connection. And that is actually the theme of this conference. So there you go.